Okay, so welcome everybody uh, for this uh, meeting of the Economic Policy Working Group at Hoover Institution. We're very pleased to have our colleague John Cochran speak today about this beautiful title, R is less than G, in quotes. John is, uh, of course, the Rosemary and Jack Anderson Senior Fellow at Hoover. He's the author of this great blog called Grumpy Economist, and he's on his way to finish a book about the theory of the price level, doing so many things. So we'll, uh, we'll entertain questions. I think, John, you're okay by an interruption. So just yep. use the chat function, use scream out loud, um, or, or uh, just whatever you want. Mechanical hands are fine too. So uh, uh, John, go ahead. Thank you so much. Yeah, I'm, I should emphasize, I, I view today more as uh, <clears throat> leading a discussion than giving a lecture. I'm going to uh, put together a couple of talks, essays, so forth I've given on this topic, but it's not, um, you know, it's not an AER paper, at least yet by any stretch of the imagination. Um, so uh, let me just start by framing it. Uh, at least I think the question of debt sustainability is the macro question <clears throat> of our time. Will we pay this off painfully? Will we pay this off painlessly? Uh, what, what's going to happen with uh, government debt the way we're going? It is also one of the most, interestingly, one of the most hotly disputed macro questions of our time. <clears throat> uh, because of, I think, largely uh, because of this question, uh, is R less than G. <clears throat> so to illustrate that, that the hope here, uh, <clears throat> I, I wrote down a simple equation of debt dynamics. It says that the increase in the debt GDP ratio, uh, it, it grows by the interest rate, but declines by the growth rate of GDP, obviously, <clears throat> um, uh, less any uh, real primary surpluses uh, relative to GDP that we run. So that's what R increases debt, uh, deficits increase debt, and but growth increases GDP, the denominator. Now, the possibility that R is less than G, we normally think of the interest rate as being higher than the growth rate of the economy, but the possibility that the interest rate is less than the growth rate of the economy, R less than G, just stare at that differential equation. That means the thing in here is negative. So that means uh, if that's true and it lasts and so forth, um, you can um, raise uh, some debt. You could you could uh, run some big deficits, raise the debt, be over why it gets big, and then just roll that over forever. And the debt will grow at the rate R, but the GDP will grow at the rate G. So the debt to GDP ratio will wash away all on its own with no subsequent surpluses. Um, as uh, Olivier Blanchard said in his American Economic Association speech, uh, fiscal expansion may have no fiscal cost. And I want to, uh, Blanchard's speech is a, a touchstone here. Of course, he's not the only one doing this stuff. But this, I, I forecast this AEA presidential speech to go down uh, parallel to Milton Friedman's. Now, I'm sorry to my other AEA president who's sitting here for uh, overly <laughs> uh, praising Blanchard. But Blanchard did, like Milton Friedman say, he called a strike. He called a home run. <laughs> he said, uh, here's what'll happen if you go out and, uh, and run a big fiscal expansion. And then the government immediately went out and ran a big fiscal expansion. Now we'll see if it turns out the way he said it would, but that certainly uh, makes it a very important touchstone. Also mark down Yellen uh, version one here. Uh, as of January, our treasury secretary, Janet Yellen, was saying, don't worry about it. Uh, interest rates are low. We have plenty of fiscal space. Now, the problem with writing any policy paper is that the narrative changed. Uh, those of you who aren't following the current narrative in Washington is, oh, heavens, we have to pay for it all. Let's raise corporate tax rates and taxes on the rich. Uh, <clears throat> but I think that desire was out there beforehand. So our, our less than G is still going to be with us. I'm also noticing an explosion of academic work on R minus G. So um, uh, Blanchard's, uh, Blanchard's challenge has been, has been met. So I wanna, what do I want to do? I want to ask two questions of this. Uh, the first is just to tee up a, a short discussion on some of the economic uh, forces. Uh, why is the interest rate so low? Will it last? That certainly is, if, if you want to 
the, this appetizing possibility, um, we want the R minus G to last a while. So thinking a little bit about the economic foundations will help us there. I won't go very far here. There's a long, long list that you can think about, but at least I wanted to tee up some discussion of why is R low to help us think about will this continue or is this uh, something only transitory? The main thing I want to talk about in the paper, uh, the, the first paper, there's a paper, low interest rates and government debt on my website on that. Uh, the second one is uh, the R minus G, R less than G paper that um, you saw in the title. There is a paper going with this. And the point I want to make here, uh, the question is, does it even work as a matter of economic theory? Now, it looks easy from this differential equation, but wait a minute, it might not be so easy. So the point I want to make, in case I don't get there, you guys are known to be a, uh, a, uh, a chatty audience, uh, which is good. But in case I don't get that, the point I'm going to get there is first, R less than G is theoretically great fun, but I will claim it is irrelevant to the US current US fiscal policy issues. Uh, like seniorage, a government that can print money, uh, it is a small benefit to government finance, finances, but it nonetheless remains the case that the large kind of deficits we're talking about now still need to be repaid for with primary surpluses, even if we observe R less than G. So it's cute, but quantitatively irrelevant is point number one. Point number two is a little more technical, uh, and, but I do wanna go through it uh, in part to get your views on it. Uh, we will have to look at some equations. Um, which R? Well, um, in, in a world of perfect certainty, all R's are the same, but we all R's are not the same in our world. And what we tend to do is look at average returns in our world and then use perfect certainty modeling. And I think this is a huge mistake. Um, it can be, we can see average rates of return on government debt lower than the growth rate of the economy. And yet debt is still equal to the present value of surpluses. Uh, you still have to pay things off in present value terms. The viewed with a world of uncertainty, the grow out of debt strategy is like writing out of the money put options and calling it arbitrage, which is a great uh, long time tested technique for um, running hedge fund, at least for a while. So the lesson there will be don't calibrate certainty models with uncertainty data. Okay, uh, that, that's the more novel uh, and technical part of, of what I have to say today. Let's get going. So R less than G, why? How long will it last? Uh, here's the 10 year treasury rate in the uh, uh, core CPI. And you can see since 1980, we've been on a steady downward trend of real interest rates. Now, uh, many graphs start in 1980. <laughs> And you can see that that's a little bit dishonest, um, but certainly since 1980, it's been a st steady downward trend. Now, uh, economists tend to jump to sexy fun stuff like the savings glut and foreign exchange reserves uh, and, and uh, quantitative easing and the zero bound and liquidity of government bonds and risk sharing uh, ability of government bonds and so forth. Uh, and I, I think that these are good candidates for icing on the cake. But when you see something this uh, long lasting and this steady, uh, I, I, um, my first point is that I think we may be missing the actual cake, not the icing. What does basic economics say about it, uh, thing like this? And I, why do we not know? It, it is a little bit of, a, it's interesting reflection on the economics profession that something that's been going on now for 40 years. <laughs> is still the subject of all sorts of interesting papers and cocktail party conversations and words like gluts and imbalances and so forth, uh, rather than something that we have a well understood uh, uh, theory. Of. But what I wanna add to this is back to basics. Um, basics number one, why would an interest rate go down? Well, the first equation uh, of econ intertemporal economics is the interest rate equals the rate of impatience, the psychological rate of inflation plus a coefficient intertemporal elasticity of substitution times the per capita growth rate, G, G minus N, where N is population growth. It's also equal to the marginal product of capital minus depreciation, which I didn't put in because I didn't want to reuse delta, but you know what I mean. So that's kind of where you'd think we would start thinking about low interest rates. <clears throat> and uh, as I look at the data, the, the graph here is the growth in real potential GDP. I use potential just to smooth it all out. And the fact is, is what you know, in the 1960s, we were growing at 4.5%. In the 1980s, we were growing at 3%. Uh, 
Uh, now, uh, since uh, an event in 2000 that Bob Hall likes to uh, it likes to uh, use as the beginning of our current troubles, GDP has been growing at less than 2%. Uh, so um, sort of the first thing that nobody talks about, but seems like an obvious thing to think about, is that G went down. <laughs> and if G goes down from 45 to 2%, and gamma is a number bigger than 1, R is going to go down, and R is going to go down more than G, and you will see an R less than G in a period of, uh, of extremely slow growth. Now, why did slow growth happen? Well, discuss amongst yourselves. We've had several great seminars among this. The obvious thing, uh, you know, right now, um, production is less capital intensive. Uh, we're going more towards services. Uh, the Chad Jones question, uh, maybe we're just running out of ideas. It's the end of growth. There's nothing to invest in. Or um, my, my favorite, because I'm still kind of grumpy and I work at Hoover, uh, I think that the marginal product of capital is held down by a, a taxed, regulated, and, and increasingly oligopolized economy, uh, theta. Uh, I don't have anything new to say about those options, but those are certainly good stories for why long-term growth is lower. Now, how long will it last? I hope it won't last very long. <laughs> uh, I hope Chad's wrong. Uh, not for Chad, who, who I love, and I, I, he's always brilliant, but I hope he's wrong on this one and that we can go back to 3 and 4% growth. Uh, maybe we can get rid of those, uh, all those taxes and regulations or whatever. Now, the equation sort of seems to think, well, well boy, then you're in trouble because R will go up more than G will go up. Um, but hold on just a second, Beryl. So should we fear uh, G growing and R growing greater and that causing trouble for the government? Uh, I'm going to say no. And the major reason is because as G goes up, everything gets better and government surpluses are much easier in a higher G economy than it was. Hey, John, let Darryl. me interrupt. Darryl, yeah. has the Darryl go ahead. I just wanted Darryl to finish the sentence. question. Yeah. John, I didn't mean to interrupt your flow. It's going great. Uh, Bob Gordon said that productivity is very unpredictable. Is there any hypothesis that's, that you think is tenable that uh, that we're seeing, we've seen a lot of reduction in growth due to reduction in productivity and that that could turn around, we just don't know. Well, that's, uh, so this is, now Now we're at the uh, the cocktail hour <laughs> part of this. Uh, right, where does product, where does after tax, after distortion productivity come from? Uh, there's all sorts of great work on this so, sort of, I'm, I'm attracted to the view that only 5% of the people are actually doing all the productivity and everyone else is in, in HR and compliance and so forth. So there's, there's room to make life more productive. We're maybe in a pause and the AI is about to come and make everyone more productive. I, I don't know, I hope so. Um, certainly all this great work uh, Pete Clino and, and Chad have been doing on um, how productivity is so widely dispersed. If we could just get small businesses to be more efficient, maybe productivity would go back up, but yeah. Anyway, I just said, I don't know, and added four more stories. Uh, if you have some some data or facts, <clears throat> like will will and how productivity, actually, I, I was wrong. This is not the most important macro question. Uh, will and how will long-term productivity growth return? That's the most important macro question of the day. Uh, this is the second most important macro question of the day. Um, we've heard the talk about uh, savings from middle-aged boomers. Uh, in general, uh, lower population growth is, is a bad thing for government finances. There's this idea that middle-aged boomers saved a lot. Uh, we've, we've had seminars here, so I won't say more. Uh, if so, that's one that will reverse. Uh, so the idea this is something exploitable forever, maybe not. Now, on top of the basic economics, um, oh, the second thing that strikes me is, is a basic economics that we are forgetting is we, we plot everything since 1980 and talk about growth theory, but wait, <laughs> something happened in 1980. What happened in 1980? Quiz, <laughs> what happened in 1980? Well, 1980 was a major event in the end of inflation. So uh, we have not, this, this trend only started from a very high base in 1982. Now that seems like something we ought to be talking about here. Uh, are we gonna return to what happened in the 70s? Interpreting this data is a little hard. Some of this may simply be ex post real rates because people feared a return to inflation. And I, I think that's a, um, that's a credible story, at least for the 1980s. Very interesting thing is happening now. Uh, now bonds have, uh, why is R low? 
nominal bonds have, are strongly negative beta securities right now. Uh, in a recession, we get less inflation. So bing, uh, bonds get a good return from that. And interest rates go down, so they get another good return from that. So negative beta securities get a payoff less than the risk-free rate. So that's part of the wonders of government bonds paying very low returns. Once said that, though, that is a force that could go away quickly because it wasn't there in the 1970s. The 1970s bonds were positive beta securities. Inflation got worse in, in recessions. Uh, so the unanchoring of inflation expectations is a under talked about uh, force for low government bond rates now, and one that I think uh, could go away. Now, the data isn't, this is something else that happened in 1980, of course, is we had malaise and stagflation in the 1970s, and we did have strong growth and productivity growth in the 1980s. Uh, so that, that's another reason why R may have been low in the 70s and then high in the early 1980s. But I certainly would, would worry about, uh, we worry about like, sort of liquidity premiums and so forth, but the negative beta of governments of nominal bonds seems like one worth mentioning and, and talking about. On top of that, now, now comes the icing on the cake, which are the ones that everybody else is, uh, seems to be talking about. Elena, please go ahead. Uh, hi, John. Yes, a quick quick question, clarification question, mostly. So you started off presenting us a differential equation for the time evolution of the debt to GDP ratio. That one so forward has, so to speak, win-win implications. So you're arguing now that there are expectational assumptions embedded into it that looking retrospectively at historical data don't seem to be supported. But what, what was, I missed the transitions between uh, what, what you showed us in this one. Is this the argument you're, you're trying to build? No, I'm, or that I'm in general, to... that equation is not well posed beside. I'm going to get, back, I'm gonna get okay. back to what's wrong with that equation. Well, right now, we're just looking at why is R low? Why did R fall so much? And what's the chance that R, R all on its own? I mean, to the equation, if, uh, if R all on its own rises, then your big plan to just roll over the debt is in trouble. So what are the forces behind low R and what's the chance that R goes up all on its own? So we talked about sort of basic economics, which I'm in this debate seems to be kind of ignored. Uh, both, I bring these two things up mostly because no one seems to talk about them. People do talk a lot about the liquidity and exorbitant privilege of government debt. And um, the, I'll, I'll give you 20, 30 basis points on that, but it doesn't seem like that accounts for the big trend. Here I have treasury rates, 30-year uh, mortgage rates, and uh, the AAA bond rate. <clears throat> um, and uh, you can see these things kind of all go in lockstep. Now there is, you know, treasury rates are a little bit below those other two. So there's a liquidity value to treasuries, but they've been a little bit below those other two all along. So that doesn't seem like it's accounting for this big decline in, in interest rates. Um, similarly, we talk about the U.S. as being the world's safe haven and, and you know, exorbitant privilege and so forth. Now, that's a, that is a fact. It's an important one because it's limited in scale. So many of these things, we need to think about what happens if we scale it up and how quickly does it go away. But I'm not even persuaded it's there. <laughs> so here's the U.S. versus uh, Euro 10-year uh, rates. And, and you can see actually right now, as you know, if you're looking at the, at the data, the U.S. rate is above the European rate. European rates are actually often negative. Uh, so where's our exorbitant privilege? Now, there's, of course, the question, well, maybe everyone's expecting a depreciation of the dollar, but we also know that that one doesn't work so well. So it's not clear that the U.S. being the world's currency is getting a whole lot of interest rate benefit out of that relative to at least the Europeans. Uh, so the fun ones look less. Uh, my quick overview here is, we seem to have missed a lot of cake and we seem to be having a lot of fun with the icing. Uh, and surprisingly, we don't really know why R is so low and how long it's gonna last, which should make you uh, worried about a plan uh, that R is gonna stay below G for the next 50 years, which is the plan we're gonna talk about. Okay, the second thing I wanna talk about today is a little more back to theory. Uh, let's go back to, as Elena uh, pointed us to, the basic differential equation. Uh, there it is. And the uh, scenarios, the delicious scenario, um, we can 
raise debt by, we just did $5 trillion and more is on its way. Then uh, the promise is we can just roll over that debt. The debt to GDP ratio gently declines. Uh, we never have to raise surpluses. We get a fiscal expansion with no fiscal cost. Uh, how about it? Um, now, the first thing in, in this, uh, oh, I have some tangential points, which I'm going to make because they're fun. Uh, in this whole business, I'm, I'm interested to observe that Washington understands the logical conclusions better than economists. You read Olivier Blanchard, and, and he's very sober. There's lots of ifs, ands, and buts about this, very clearly spelled out. And he says, OK, therefore, we should uh, borrow some money and invest in positive net present value infrastructure. Even Stephanie Kelton, uh, bless her heart, the author of Modern Monetary Theory, uh, who thinks you can just print up money, uh, says, and therefore we can invest it in communities and build things that we need and so forth. Um, <clears throat> Washington uh, it seems to think, oh, no budget constraint means no budget constraint. We can simply um, borrow or print money and hand it out to every registered voter. Uh, we are financing a consumption binge on borrowed money. Um, which is the logical conclusion. If there's no government budget constraint, why are you bothering to talk about wise investments? Let uh, BMW in every in every uh, garage. John, uh, Sebastian, yeah, go say, Sebastian. Sebastian, has a, Sebastian has a quick question. Yeah, yeah, I I, um, I don't know, John, if this is the moment to ask the question, but you have the the equation on the slide there. Uh, and it's not surprising that Blanchard. Uh, based his uh, uh, lecture on his article on this equation. It's been used by the IMF for 30 years or so, but it's used in a different way. You equate that to zero, then you determine what's the B over Y that a country can sustain, say Argentina. You make some assumptions about R and G, and then you tell the Argentines they have to run a primary surplus of 4% of GDP in order to sustain that debt. So you just turn it around. And um, my question, I guess it has two parts. One is why not use that approach, the IMF approach, instead um, of what you're doing? Uh, we have one equation and we can have only one unknown. And the second question is B over Y has gone from um, 30% until 1980, then it went to 60, stayed for a long time at 60, then it went to 100, stayed for a long time at 100, and now it's at 130. So um, whether that uh, stepwise makes you react in any way. So it's a two part question, I guess. Um, uh, my next slide is gonna talk about exactly those things. Uh, and uh, one, another, I, I started with the appetizing thing that Blanchard started with, hey, let's, borrow a ton of money and then slowly pay it off. But you're exactly right. The other thing you could do, if R is less than G, you can finance a steady uh, steady deficit. Uh, and, and we'll talk about that possibility uh, as well. Uh, and um, the, you correctly point out, this story presumes that you're on a converging path always, not that you're sitting on a uh, that you're sitting on an explosive path. And that's exactly why I think this has nothing to do uh, this story has nothing to do. So anyway, that, that's the next slide. Let me just uh, 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 unload on Washington a little bit more uh, as well, because the logical, we, the R less than G is, is sold as, oh, well, we can, we can finance roads and bridges. But the logical conclusion that there is no government budget constraint is in fact much stronger. And Washington figured this out. Another way of saying it, we can finance a consumption binge, if the US government doesn't have to repay debt, why should any citizens of the US government have to repay debt? If the US government can borrow money and never have to pay it back, why should I repay my student loans? Why should I repay my mortgages? Why should we not just bail absolutely everybody out and then grow out of it? Good question. Why, why should we work? And, and why should we bother paying taxes? Why shouldn't the government just send us all checks and, and we can order from Amazon? The logical conclusion, and you can see that something's wrong here. And so, uh, what I want to push on what what is wrong here. So, John Ed, Ed Nelson has a question. Ed, do you want to? Oh, thanks, because I I can't see uh, yeah, everyone has questions. Ed? I didn't really have a question. I just wanted to make the point that the um, position that um, 
R minus G that gives this fiscal uh, virtuous circle. That's that was in the earliest responses to uh, Sergeant and Wallace. So Sebastian, I think, is, is on the right track on that score. This is not 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 a new uh, debate. It's a newly popular debate, uh, along with the observation that R has been less than G for a while. So um, you know, there's there's facts as well as uh, as uh, policy salience. So obviously not. Uh, now, there's a conventional reason why not, which is all admirably explained in Blanchard. First of all, does this scale? Is uh, marginal R less than G the same as average R less than G? Uh, can you take this thing and, uh, and, and, you, and you know, will it stay there if you borrow a ton of money? And the first question is obviously, well, as you borrow more money, perhaps the R will rise. So Blanchard's quite clear, crowding out. By definition, this is going to cause crowding out by accounting. Uh, you know, all the borrowing you're doing is coming out of savings that would otherwise go into investment. Um, similarly, so the other, suppose that R is low because there's a liquidity premium. People, you know, hold government bonds like U.S. government bonds like money. Well, if you double or triple the amount of government bonds they're going to hold, that liquidity premium will go away. Now, these are not particularly salient um, because who's worried about crowding out now with you know, interest rates so very low? And um, it certainly raises the theoretical possibility, okay, well, borrow, let R rise. And then when you see R about equal to G, you can stop and just sit there forever. It also leads to a very controllable, predictable feel. Fine, you know, borrow. Uh, borrow but 10, 20, 100% of GDP. And when you see the R starting to rise, then you'll be able to stop it in time. A little more worrisome is that the R could rise all on its own. I, I mentioned the negative beta. If inflation expectations become un, unhinged, then you lose the negative beta uh, quickly, res the reserve status uh, quickly. Uh, and uh, really, uh, you know, central to this whole, to this discussion, I think all sides agree that differential equation is not the whole picture. There is also a limit on the debt to GDP ratio. Um, you, you cannot, uh, you, this differential equation might say, just run it up to 1,000%, 10,000% and then run it down. But there is some limit out there where the, the markets will not roll over our debt. Uh, and so that's the one that worries me most about it. Uh, if we sit for 50 to 100 years at a large debt to GDP ratio, we spend the whole time in threat of a doom loop where a, a, a credit uh, spread rise in R raises the deficit costs, then either we have to explode the debt and, and hit the limit, uh, or we, we run into a, uh, a sudden, uh, a sudden uh, debt crisis. Um, so that seems like to me the most salient worry. The second most salient worry, hold on Sebastian a second, is um, suppose we go up to 200% to debt to GDP ratio, you need some dry powder. So what happens when the next crisis comes along and you want to borrow a ton of money to fight World War III and the, and the pandemic and the real pandemic? Well, then you're out of dry powder. So those two seem to me like the, the biggest reasons to worry. Uh, uh, Sebastian, and then we're going to go on to some economic theory. Yeah, very, very, very quickly. Um, I, I think that I have to pay my debt. And if when I die, my children will have to pay my credit card debt. But IBM or Microsoft never has to pay its debt because they live forever. Right? Well, Sebastian does not live forever. Uh, we have Daryl and we have other uh, finance people here that make uh, have the, the answer to this. but. I, I sit on boards, on corporate boards. We never, ever, ever think when we do strategy planning over the next 40 years, we never talk about paying off our debt. We talk about different forms of debt and keeping it within certain limits, but never paying it off, right? No, you, you pay it in present value. <laughs> oh, yeah. So yeah. If you, I mean, think of a company well, we like give perpetuity. It, we, yeah. You issue the perpetuity, you pay the interest on the perpetuity, and you're paying it back in present value. Yeah, but be over why it stays. Okay, so that we have really agreement. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so when I mean payback, I mean payback in present value. In present value. Yeah. <clears throat> now, if uh, if uh, IBM or Amazon or Facebook, if they could keep growing, G, <laughs> uh, faster than the interest on their debt, then that forever, then that would apply to them as well. Uh, the government just is more long lasting, and the government has a claim to the taxes of growing population, which 
we'll see how long population keeps growing, but that's the other thing that makes our government different from a corporation. So John, Michael Boskin has a question. Yeah. Thank you. Good. Um, Go terrific, I'm a, I'm a fan of what you've done. I, I think it's worth raising the question of whether it's worth deconstructing Blanchard a little bit more. For example, he starts with no pre-existing government and hence no debt, no taxes, no anything. I'm gonna do that, yeah. So, I mean, so you're talking about what if we start at 200%, but he's starting at 100% and ignoring it, okay? And he really downplays the dual equilibria when investors start perceiving the debt. There's an acknowledgement in Blanchard that they're, they're, oh, gee, there might be multiple equilibrium doom loops, but blah, 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 I don't believe it. At least, but at least it's acknowledgement as a possibility, even for a country that prints its own uh, current currency. Yeah, he also- You don't think it's a problem? I do. <laughs> One of the issues going on here also, however, is that it's not just the United States that's doing this. Um, and he has a closed economy framework. Now, sure, if we're doing it alone and foreign investors plow, plow down and plow their, plow their money in here, we get uh, the benefit of higher investment financed by foreign capital for a while. We pay back the returns on it to them. But uh, if the other countries react and start saying, well, gee, our capital's being drained out of here, <laughs> yeah, because the U.S. has become such a large share of the uh, incremental uh, capital in the world, uh, it's all going to the U.S. Treasury, they're going to react as well. So, um, you know, there's an issue about whether we can all do this simultaneously and whether we should be looking at uh, each country's domestic rates or some global rate or some deviation from global rates and things of this sort. So yeah, my, my fear is really kind of a global sovereign debt uh, crisis. Uh, although the Europeans are actually in better shape than we are in many ways because they have middle class taxes to pay for the middle class entitlements. So the real problem is not so much a limit on the debt to GDP ratio. It's a limit on the debt to GDP ratio relative to your plan for paying it off. You can borrow a huge amount of money if you got a plan for paying it off. And the problem with this, this next slide is the US's central problem is we don't have a plan for paying it off. The Europeans are in better long run fiscal shape than we are. Uh, yeah, horrible growth, no population growth, but you know enough taxes to pay for a lot of their promises. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a big question there about how you think, uh, how far our welfare state's going to get in that, right? Because we have a lot of a lot of stuff that's likely to be financed by uh, payroll taxes. I agree, if we had a value added tax, it would be more obvious, but um, I don't know that I fully agree with that because they have. Uh, they're, they're having a very hard time reducing the growth of their entitlements too, because they're even more entrenched there than here and, and are spread to an even larger fraction of the population. So politically it's harder. Well, Whereas, they've accepted very low growth as the, as the price of their um, tax financed welfare state. One way of looking at their use, the adoption of value added taxes to finance the growth of government is that's the trade-off they've done. They figured they get back, if they can, they switch to a, a less growth inhibiting tax structure and they're, they're much less progressive than we are. Tax capital much more lighter and almost yep. all. Can okay. I ask you, John, following up on Michael's question that thinking about, I'm thinking about the GDP growth series for Southern Europe. So they are in situations where G may be arguably decreasing faster than our does. What, uh, what yeah, are your but, thoughts about this? Well, uh, I, um, you know, G my thought remains that the savior of everything is G. <laughs> uh, Productivity-led uh, growth is that's how you pay back your debts. And so Southern Europe may be on the other end of R might be zero and G might be two, negative 2%, two and that's going to lead them to being in real trouble. But the potential savior, especially if we get the, the debt and this projection and the taxes under control. Yeah, but which we just need a tax, a reform tax. Anyway, let's get to... Um, uh, my first main point is that this has been a lot of fun, but this is irrelevant to current U.S. fiscal policy issues, which basically restates a thing a couple of you have said. The, the Blanchard uh, conceptual experiment, you start, from, um, uh, you start from a situation of zero primary surpluses, you borrow a lot and you return to zero primary surpluses, has nothing to do with what is going on in the U.S. right now. <clears throat> so... Um, let me, uh, here's, this is just the CBO uh, projections of what we're going to do uh, of, our, our of our deficits. And remember that the first, first scenario, I think Sebastian's scenario is a good one. Uh, let's take scenario one. R is 1% less than G. Lovely. Looks like the no budget constraint. 
The debt to GDP ratio is, let's just take 100%. What that allows is a steady 1% of GDP deficit. That's right. Uh, you, you can, this is Sebastian's point, uh, let the left-hand side be zero, then the deficit to GDP ratio is 1% of the debt to GDP, GDP whatever R minus G is. Um, now that's cute, but that's not where we're at. <laughs> We've got 5% uh, debt to G, 5% uh, real primary deficits in good times. And then every 10 years, we seem to have a once in a hundred year flood and we chalk up another 25% of deficit to GDP ratios. <clears throat> and then the entitlements are gonna come along. <clears throat> and on top of that, you wanna talk about one-time expansions that seem to go on forever because they are expansions of entitlements like uh, home health care provided by unionized home health care workers. Um, so that's just that scenario the possibility to have a 1% of GDP perpetual deficit doesn't tell me anything about 5% of GDP, 25% in a crisis, and then a massive fiscal expansion. It's just quantitatively irrelevant to the question at hand. Now I got a, a uh, uh, Yvonne Warning uh, pestered me a lot about this last time I gave it. I said, well, wait a minute, John, look at your equations. 500% debt to GDP ratio could finance 5% uh, deficits forever. But there we have to talk about what is the limit of debt to GDP ratio, where we can sit there forever and markets will roll this over <clears throat> without uh, putting us in, in trouble. The second uh, way of saying the same thing, so there's kind of two, conce one conceptual experiment as Sebastian put it, debt to GDP stays constant 100%, finance a perpetual deficit, isn't that lovely? It looks like you know present values aren't holding because the, the value is 100% of GDP, the flow is negative 100% forever. Yep, that's right. Uh, but that's quantitatively not gonna bail us out. The second conceptual experiment was uh, we start at a, we start um, in a happy state, we borrow a lot of money and then we slowly pay it off with zero, zero primary surpluses afterwards. So scenario two, the one-time expansion, <clears throat> maybe you know, borrow 30 trillion for the Green New Deal and then just roll it off with zero primary, surpl primary surpluses afterwards. Well, here's the CBO's debt to GDP ratios. And I put in an artistic, uh, ar artistic possibility. Uh, notice what happened, their, their forecasts as of here were just gentle growth. They didn't put into the fact that, oh, there was gonna be a great decision and a pandemic and then Ten years from now, something else bad is going to happen. So every ten years, we seem to uh, go up like that. So this is, in fact, uh, the baseline. Kevin. Yeah. Hey, John. One thing you haven't talked about, but it's really relevant, and I've been modeling this. And uh, like, so I think I have a pretty accurate model that says that over the next ten years, first the CBO forecast is way low because they have basically spending the GDP dropping 10% next year. It's just not, who's gonna let that happen, right? And if they, they don't account for all the stuff that's gonna happen this year. But when I look at what markets historically have absorbed, I have fed uh, ownership of US debt going to about 85% of GDP over the next 10 years. And, and so does it matter who, who owns this stuff? Probably yes, and maybe yeah. no. Why, why but you're not talking about it, so, so why not? Why did you make that choice? Uh, I'm, I'm, this is incredibly simplified. So okay. it, it is a very interesting fact that foreigners are not buying treasury debt anymore. And that makes me worry too. Um, but I'm, I'm just thinking, you know, let's start with com perfect, complete markets. And then, so tell me why you're worried. No, that was an honest, honest you know, uh, I'm, I'm just keeping it really simple, but um, somebody's got to own it. <laughs> <laughs> now here I would say, so, this, the scenario, remember the scenario, the scenario was we start at zero primary surpluses. Uh, then, and, and we start in a scenario where debt is declining because R is less than G. We bump up the debt and then let decline again. We are not in the situation of debt is declining because R is less than G. And we are not in a scenario where debt is forecast to decline because R is less than G. We bump it up once and go to zero primary surpluses. If the US committed to zero primary surpluses for the next 50 years, I think there would be a party at Hoover like you've never seen. This is a, a austerity hawk conservatives dream to go back to zero primary surpluses. Uh, so the bottom line is R less than G of 1% 
does not allow a perpetually growing debt to GDP ratio. So it just has nothing to do with the situation that, that we're facing right now. By the way, John, the CBO projects that R will rise a fair amount and be above G over this period. It's just they, so, and, and the CBO has been wrong. So, uh, you know, the, the R less than G guys uh, have, have a point there. As have um, financial markets. The CBO is not a forecast. It is a projection, which I think is important to remember. This is a, because when you read the CBO reports, what they say is, here's what happens if you guys don't do anything about it. Do something about it. <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, that's the nature of the, the CBO forecast. Um, uh, the last point, even so, the reversion takes a long time. Here I plotted what does 1% uh, R less than G do? Suppose we bump up debt to GDP to 150 or to 200%. How long does it take to come back to 100% or to come back to something more reasonable like 50%? And the answer there is even 150, it's 50 or 100 years. If we go up to 200%, it's 70 years or, or 140 years. Uh, so these are not, this is a long, long time. We better bet that R stays uh, less than G if we're going to have to follow this strategy. What are the two colors meant to convey? Here, just to distinguish the lines. The red line starts at 200% debt to GDP, and it takes, uh, it takes 140 years to get back. The blue line starts at 150 and takes 110 years to get back. Okay. So they say we just will grow out of it, but no, our great-grandchildren will grow out of it. <laughs> and I want to remind us that people say, oh, well, we, you know, look, look what happened after World War II. We'll just do that again. Uh, the World War II exit was not painless. This is a little cluttered because it comes from another paper, but the, the graph, the, the thing that matters here is the red and green lines, which are two different measures of the primary surplus. The green line is the, C, is the uh, uh, BLS's measure, the red is my measure. But we ran. Yes, we ran steady primary surpluses all the way up to Anno Cerebralis 1975. And that was a big part of growing out of World War II. We are not running steady primary surpluses now. Uh, so, and the World War II exit was not painless. There was capital controls, there was inflation. Uh, it wasn't it painless in the UK either. So uh, this whole story of we can just borrow it and then grow out of it, um, and just like World War II is, is a lot more fraught. So the last thing I want to talk about is a little more technical, but I think it is important. This is stuff that at least I did not understand uh, three months ago. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and I think highlights a, a, a technical mistake we can make here. So I want to share with you and also get, get your reactions. Uh, the summary of what I'm going to say is that the chance of a small R less than G, uh, I'm sorry, this is the summary so far. R less than G of 1%, <clears throat> what does that do for us? We can have a 1% deficit while it lasts. And when it stops lasting, we can't do that. But any substantial extra deficits than the 1%, you have to meet those by a substantial period of surpluses to bring debt to GDP back in less than three generations. So in that sense, I think of R less than G like seniorage, a government that finances itself only with money has R less than G, isn't that wonderful? And they get to print up a little bit of extra money every year as the, as the economy grows. That does not mean that they can uh, print up $30 trillion of, of uh, extra money and count on it just to melt away. They would just get inflation for that. So we're in a similar situation. This is a quantitative question. Uh, if we had R less than G 10 percentage points, then we could then we'd be in a lot better situation. But you know the plausible magnitudes are one or two at, at best. So that's my conclusion on why I think this point is irrelevant to the current U.S. fiscal policy challenges. Now I want to go on to the slightly more theoretical issue. It still looks like R less than G means there's no present value budget constraint uh, and uh, manna from heaven. So. Um, why is that? Why is it really that you have to repay your debts? And the central point is our economy, which R, our economy has liquidity, frictions, and uncertainty. There's lots of R's to choose from. And it may happen that the rate of return on government debt is less than the average growth rate of the economy, but still present values converge and debts must be repaid in present value terms. 
uh, even though it looks like you can just roll over debt forever and never worry about it. So the lesson is be careful using measures from our world and using them in perfect foresight modeling. And part of that is, you know, there's this apparent, as a puzzle, sort of a problem set puzzle, there's an apparent discontinuity that R one basis point less than G and it's manna from heaven, Green New Deal, uh, ma magical monetary theory, never pay anything back, R greater than G by one basis point. And here come the bond vigilantes and its fiscal austerity. Now that can't possibly be true. So uh, one thing I'll do is try to resolve that puzzle and say, no, things have got to be continuous as you go slightly less than slightly greater than. Okay, so that's what leads us to sort of the theoretical questions. So I'm going to give you a couple of examples. Um, let me start with the hidden put option example. You can see the, my history of teaching finance here. So here's a little economy, power utility, uh, an endowment, which is uh, IID normal consumption growth. I picked some parameters uh, to generate the results I want <laughs> of, ris of risk aversion, um, uh, intertemporal uh, time, pre time preference, and uh, a lot of volatility driving this example. In this example, the ex I jiggered it so expected growth rate is 3%, and the risk-free interest rate, because of this large, uh, this large uh, volatility term, is only 1.5%. So it's an example where R is less than G. Uh, the risk-free rate is less than the, the, the average growth of the economy. So let's try the strategy. Let's borrow some money, roll it over forever at the risk-free rate uh, on government debt, and count on G to come bail us out. Now, if we take these numbers and do that analysis in a risk-free model, it is a free lunch. The one plus R grows slower than the one plus G and our initial borrowing will just melt away as a fraction of GDP. And in fact, it will look like the consumer's transversality condition uh, holds here. The transversality condition says that marginal utility times the value of debt has to go to zero. Well, what's marginal utility here? Beta is e to the minus delta. Consumption growth is e to the g times t, which we raised to the minus gamma. We're doing perfect certainty here. How does, the, uh, grow, how does government debt grow? Well, government debt starts at b naught, grows at the interest rate. The interest rate is that little formula there. And look, the delta cancels, the gamma cancels. All you've got is this, this term here, which is negative. So in fact, uh, the, it looks like not just that the debt to GDP ratio goes down, but in fact, the discounted value of debt goes down. But that's a mistake because this is not an, a perfect certainty economy. This is an economy with, uh, with, uh, without perfect certainty. What's the real, uh, what happens here in, the, what's happens to the real transversality condition if the government borrows money, rolls it over forever? Well, the real condition is the expected discounted terminal value of wealth, right? Well, what's that? This is, this is, uh, you actually can, this one is one you can actually do. The expect, this, this thing is growing deterministically at one plus RF to the T. This guy here, the expected value of that is the risk-free rate. So you can see this example, in fact, violates the transversality condition. The government cannot borrow money, roll it over forever, and count on that, and count on the consumer's transversality condition to hold. Borrowing money requires surpluses in high marginal utility states. And the mistake we made here was taking an uncertain economy and, and applying certainty logic to it. Now, to make this salient, what actually happened? Here's, here's the simulation. Start at, uh, start at log of zero, so there's my debt. I roll over the debt, debt grows at the risk-free rate, right? Now, the mistake I made is that I said, well, what about, let's just, uh, let's use the average consumption growth rate. The average consumption growth rate is 3%. So consumption grows like that, yay. The debt to consumption ratio is gonna fall and we never have to pay this thing off. But we don't live in a world of uncertainty. We live, we, certainly, we live in a world of uncertainty. Here are some actual consumption paths here. You might get lucky. 
consumption might actually grow a lot and the debt to GDP ratio goes away. But you might get unlucky. Consumption growth might not be as good as you think. And, uh, and therefore, the debt to consumption ratio is going get, to get worse. And this, watch this blue line. This blue line is a situation of terrible uh, growth and therefore very high marginal utility. It has a high uh, contingent claim value. So turned around, here is the blue line again. Now I'm the debt to GDP ratio. So low debt, low GDP is a high debt to GDP ratio. And, and what, they prom what they forecasted for us, because they always forecast means is that debt, that GDP would grow faster than debt and the debt to GDP ratio would go down. That might happen, might happen even faster than they said if growth comes out well. But if growth comes out badly, the debt to GDP ratio ought might explode. And somewhere along this blue line, you, you get the debt crisis. Now, when the debt crisis happens, what happens? Then you got to pay back your debts and you have to pay them back in the worst of all possible worlds. You have to pay them back when margin utility is high, when, when you've been impoverished. You've, you have become Venezuela and all of a sudden you have to pay back the US government debt. And that's a very, that's a very costly thing to happen. So the bottom line uh, in, in finance, when my students ask me, how should I, how should I uh, run a money management fund and, and generate alpha? I say, write out of the money put options, invest in the S&P uh, 500 index, report your absolutely consistent 2% alpha year after year. Uh, oh, and by the way, keep plane tickets to Brazil in your uh, desk, in your uh, drawer, part, in your uh, desk uh, drawer, because when the market does actually fall 30, 40%, you're going to need those plane tickets to leave town. Uh, and, and that is, in fact, what uh, this strategy looks like. I, I had a nice back and forth with Olivier. Olivier says, yeah, it might not work out, but the chances of it not working out are not so bad, are not so few. But the states of the world where it doesn't work out are particularly bad ones. So that's lesson one on don't use, hold on a second, Steve. Don't use certainty modeling in an uncertain world, uh, at least without a great deal of caution. And uh, lesson two is coming up after Steve. Well, actually, uh, Macaulay has a question first. Robert. Oh, sorry, I, I only saw Steve. Yeah, Steve. Hey, John. Um, very interesting. Um, I wonder if you could, you can venture to actually try to put some numbers by looking at the success or lack of it in past decades of economists predicting future growth rates. Get get some kind of distribution out of that, um, and then I guess you need to take some stand on when things blow up and how painful it would be to pay off in those states of the world where things uh, fall apart. And it sounds like your, your point might, your point's in some sense even stronger. You made this, but I'm just gonna restate what you said. First, it, it might not work. Maybe that's a modest probability, but then I somehow wanna weight it by how bad things are when it doesn't work. Um, even some very rough numbers, I know it's not an easy thing to do, but some very rough numbers of those sort would kind of give, um, give you a quantitative punchline that would, I think, help sell this point even more forcefully. That's a good suggestion. In part, it's hard. So we all have our different fears. Um, I stay up at night worried about a debt crisis, which I think could happen to the US. And when the world decides that US debt is no longer a safe asset, the financial calamity that follows. I mean, we are now in this world where every crisis is met by massive government borrowing and, and spreading around money like it's manure. Imagine uh, the next crisis when, when, the, when the government says, okay, time to bail everyone out again, and it can't do it. And all of a sudden the banking system says, repo treasuries, you gotta be kidding, I don't want that stuff. Uh, that just strikes me, as, it's a calamity beyond quantification, but I, I take your point that it would be good to do it. So Harold and then Peter Fisher. Harold, Sorry. yeah, it's it's just a comment. I mean, this uh, this fine point also seems to be related to what Debbie Lucas and others are pushing. That sometimes when you evaluate uh, you know, how much you should pay for some government project, people like to discount at the safe rate, and maybe that shouldn't be done because you should be discounting at some risk-adjusted rate, and that means that many of the projects that people love to undertake, probably shouldn't be undertaken as a result. Yep. And this is big in the climate literature, um, you know, wh whether the value of improving GDP in the year 2100 uh, depends enormously on how good GDP is in the year 2100. 
Peter? I just shared a factoid on the chat function of Janet Yellen had to sign the projections of the U.S. government's financial report uh, and where uh, uh, government debt to GDP will be 75 years from now and <laughs> primary deficit. So you can you can look at my chat or you can go look at the end of the report they published at the end of March. <laughs> That's all. And, and the and the height of the oceans and the temperature in D.C. in January. <laughs> Charlie or, or John, you're keeping track of who's winning. Uh, Charlie, Charlie Plosser has a question, I think. Well, I, I don't really have a question. I want to make a comment based on what Harold said. I spent nine years at the Fed. One of my jobs was overseeing what they call financial services, which um, invest heavily in the payment system and everything else. Every capital project, the present value and cost were calculated using the risk-free rate. I spent eight years trying to convince them if an MBA student of mine came up and said, this is what we were gonna do, I'd flunk them. <laughs> so um, it, it's a terrible practice within the government and I suspect every agency does that. So I just wanted to re reinforce Harold's, uh, Harold's point that it's, it's, it's pathetic actually. So I'll, that's all I wanted to say. The pensions are notorious for uh plotting a, a certain 9% rate of return on their assets. And <laughs> anyway, go ahead. Yes. So discount rates are, are uh, skullduggery everywhere. A long history of this in public finance, including several Nobel Prize winners like Bob Wilson and Kenneth Arrow weighing in on you don't use So yeah, Arrows was a big believer in using the uh, marginal profit capital in the private sector. And, uh, and uh, I think Wilson gave the best analysis is we have to basically, you have to calculate the, uh, the covariance with national income from these projects, right? So. Yeah, you know, one of the bottom lines I'm gonna to get to, probably I'm not gonna to get to, so I'm gonna advertise it now, is for many of these questions, I'm coming to the view that um, we should look at flow accounting rather than present value accounting in part because these discount rates are so uncertain and that clarifies things tremendously. So for example, R greater than G uh, of plus one basis point mi versus minus one basis point. It's perfectly obvious on a flow accounting basis that that thing is completely continuous. Uh, it doesn't jump from uh, from infinity to to, uh, uh, to to negative infinity as as you go through zero. So Robert McCauley is back on, I think. Yes, indeed. Okay. Yes, indeed. Thank you, John. I'm sure. sorry uh, to be uh, AWOL there for a moment. Um, I was picking up on the point about the uh, significance of the Federal Reserve's ownership of the Treasury debt. And so my analysis is that that's essentially debt management, debt management that effectively shifts the duration of the Treasury's debt to the short term, to the overnight, in, in fact. And so the implication of that is when the Fed starts raising interest rates, there'll be an immediate, a much more immediate fiscal feedback loop to the deficit. And I wanted to bring to everyone's attention, Charles Goodhart's testimony to the House of Lords uh, to the effect that this would inhibit the central bank from doing its job. It, it makes it worse. I mean, the, the heart of all debt crises is short-term debt. And if we financed ourselves by perpetuities, then uh, higher interest rates would not feed through into the deficit and we would be pretty much insured from having a debt crisis. We wouldn't have a, any rollover problems. The Fed is not helping on that department. Far from it. Far from it. The Treasury could do more too, but that's another issue. Okay, uh, so let me go on because this is actually the, the meat of the paper is uh, right here. Uh, I know it's been an hour, uh, but let me encourage you to rev up a little bit because it's not as bad as it looks. Um, one of the best examples for me of R less than G and why that does not imply manna from heaven is think of, an, think of a government that has no government debt, but only issues cash, non-interest bearing money. Now, that government gets some seniorage. The rate of return on government debt is the negative of the inflation rate. Uh, which is less than the growth rate of the economy. So it's an R less than G economy. But I think we understand perfectly well, there's no magic here, that this is a limited opportunity. 
and that a government like that, if it's going to run big, big additional deficits, has to pay those back with big, big additional surpluses, even though R is less than G. So this seems like a, a good ground to look at the equations and see, well, where could we have gone wrong and think otherwise? So uh, in steady state, so what do we got here? M over PY, it's, all it's got is money. And this is also, by the way, you know, if you think the government debt has a liquidity value to it, the same equations apply to government debt as well as money. Uh, so uh, what do we got? The surplus is, that's R and G. Uh, we're gonna have Sebastian's case of a constant uh, debt to GDP ratio, constant M over PY. So in that steady state, the, uh, the uh, seniorage, the fact that um, money gets a rate of return of, of uh, negative pi can equal a steady deficit. We all understand that, but we all know that big deficits need to be paid back by surpluses. So let's express this government's finances in present value terms and see where things might go right and wrong. Now, I will not derive the two equations that follow, but uh, they should make sense when you look at them. All I've done is solve the differential equation forward in two slightly different ways. Both equations are correct. The first thing you can do is discount the future with the risk-free rate, which in this economy is discounting the future with properly with marginal utility growth, the stochastic discount factor. And let me set up the example that the risk-free rate is greater than the growth rate of the economy. So if we look at money that way, the value of debt is e to the minus RF minus G, that's a, that's, that's a positive discount factor. Uh, and then this, the, debt, the surplus to GDP ratio. And we count seniorage as the interest savings on, uh, on the outstanding debt. Uh, so this is a present value term. It says the value of debt is the discounted flow of future surpluses and the future interest savings on government debt due to the fact that there's a liquidity premium. And that counts as a convenience yield, a cash flow. That's a well-defined present value. And a terminal term, I only went out T periods, but you can see this terminal term is declining to zero. So that's in some sense the clearest way to understand our economy with R less than G. Nonetheless, it has a well-defined present value. The debt's the present value of surpluses. And therefore, if this government wants to run a whole bunch of big deficits S at one point, it had better borrow interest-bearing debt and repay those with future surpluses uh, if it doesn't want, well, it, and at some point it, it runs out of the ability to inflate. It even hits the top of the Laffer curve. So I hope that one's clear. Now, we can also discount perfectly you know, just take the same differential equation, run it forward slightly differently. You can always discount with the ex post rate of return, the government debt return. What happens if you do that? Well, the government debt return is, uh, is minus the inflation rate. So what the equation, when you solve for the differential equation, you are discounting, you hear you're discounting with the return on government debt. And you can see that this number is now a positive number because that, is that is greater uh, than G. Uh, and now this, when you discount it, the, the, now you count seniorage, you don't count seniorage as you don't count the interest costs. That's how the differential equation works out. And then a terminal term. But both of these notice, both of the E to the stuff is exploding. And that's the whole point. Um, now, uh, so now we have two terms. This equation is correct. But we have two terms, each of which explode. There's a bubble term, which explodes in the positive direction. And there's a present value term that explodes in the negative direction because surpluses here are negative. You're financing a perpetual deficit uh, with this money creation. So that's true too. So these are the same equations. We, none, we're not, neither one is right nor wrong. The question is, which is useful? Uh, if you're thinking about debts and present values of surpluses, where will you most likely see that high big deficits have to be repaid by following surpluses? Well, if you got offsetting infinities here, uh, you, you might be tempted into a mistake. One mistake you may, might make is to forget that term and to see a bubble that can be mined. And I think uh, it, uh, Marcus Brunemeyer's papers have a lot of this flavor that there's a, you can express discount, you can express things with a different discount factor in a way that there's a terminal term that's exploding and it looks like you can mine that bubble for, for a present benefit. But 
I, I think it's, uh, it's more useful to write things this way, to discount with the, to not discount with the, um, with the ex post rate of return. Now, this is, a, this is an asset pricing. I hope Daryl's still here because there's an asset pricing conundrum here. Um, this is the danger that comes in. We know that you, you can discount things with margin utility or with a stochastic discount factor. When can you discount things with something else? In particular, when can you discount using realized returns? Well, for one period payoffs, you can always use a substitute discount factor that is the one period return. That is true. Expected discounted return is correct. This is also true. Uh, R inverse times R is always one. So in a one period context, you can always discount using the rate of return. And I think that's the thinking that led us to say, well, let's not bother with, let's not bother with, uh, we'll just discount with the observed government bond return. We won't bother with trying to construct stochastic discount factors and so forth. Problem is that this does not always work. And here's the example, I put this in asset pricing language. Here's the asset pricing language example. Um, we, in a standard asset pricing model, you discount the first dividends with consumption growth. And then there's a terminal condition, margin utility times the terminal price. And this thing properly goes to zero by the consumer's transversality condition. So each of those terms separately converges. That one converges to a number and that one converges to zero. In this example, the present value is well-defined. But it, that does not mean that you can do the infinite period version of the top calculation. Let's try discounting with the rate of return. Well, we discount with the each dividend growth with the rates of the ex post rate of return. We discount the terminal value with the ex post rate of return. And what can happen is even though this one is completely fine, the two terms of this one explode in opposite directions. And when will they explode in opposite directions? <laughs> Pretty much when R is less than G. Here I re-expressed it in terms of price dividend ratio and dividend growth rates. And therefore the terminal condition is a price dividend ratio and a dividend growth rate. And when is this thing gonna blow up? Well, when the R's there are less than the growth rates of dividends there. It's a stochastic expected version of R less than G. So you're, the discount, I think part of the, tr the problem is the usual discount rate tricks we play when this guy converges, that guy does not converge. And that's underlying. Then you can, now if you're careful, you can notice you got two terms converging in opposite directions. If that's going to plus infinity, that's going to minus infinity. But if you're not careful, you can think you have bubble terms that you can mine and eat out of forever. Let me show you one more example, and then I'll conclude um, of exactly this danger. This is an example from uh, Henning Bone in 1995. Um, so consumption growth is IID. The interest rate is, as usual, the expected value of consumption growth rate. And as we saw, it's possible for this economy to generate RF is less than G. Now, suppose the government does this, a constant debt to GDP ratio. Every year, it borrows an amount equal to that year's consumption. And next, next year, it repays that amount at the risk of its constant risk-free rate, the government borrows the risk-free rate, it pays that amount, and then borrows again. So then at time t plus one, it will pay back the one plus RFCT, and it will borrow again an amount CT plus one. Are you with me? So that, let's go look at that finance. Now, we know this is another one where you know the answer ahead of time. What's the value of this government debt? Well, if it borrows CT and repays, C, repays it next period, no matter what future borrowing is, the value of that debt is CT. It's the amount it just borrowed. If it borrows CT, pays it back tomorrow with interest, the value of debt is CT. And all the future surpluses will in some sense net out. We know that answer. So let's look at present value formulas and see how they might lead us astray to a wrong answer. Well, let's do it right. The value of the debt is the discounted value of the surpluses plus the terminal condition. 
The surplus each period is pay off the debt that came in from last period and then borrow again the amount of equal to consumption this period. Well, when you, when you look at the, this, this is algebra you don't wanna do in three minutes. These two things always offset. The amount, the present value of borrowing today and paying back tomorrow is always zero. So all the intermediate terms offset and what you get is the value of the debt minus the amount you're gonna pay off at time t plus t plus a terminal condition, the amount you're gonna pay off at time t plus t. And those two things both converge nicely. So discounting with marginal utility, in this example, you see perfectly well, the value of the debt is the present value of surpluses. Both terms are converging nicely, even though R is less than G. So another example where R is less than G, yet debts are paid off uh, with following surpluses. Now suppose you do it wrong, or suppose you, it's, it's also right but misleading. Let's discount with the risk-free rate. Now we're gonna discount with the risk-free rate with the ex post government bond return, which is the risk-free rate. Again, the surplus each period is pay off last period's debt and borrow this period's debt. Again, each of the borrowing and paying off all those intermediate terms cancel. So we have a, an initial term and a terminal term and a terminal term here. But now th that guy is exploding because R is less than G and that guy explodes in the opposite direction because R is less than G. So we have two different present value formulas. You can discount with margin utility and you can get a present value term that converges and a bubble term that goes to zero. If you discount with the bond return, even though one period discount is exactly fine, you see offsetting infinities, an explosive bubble term that makes you think debt's manna from heaven and a present value term that's going off to infinity in the other direction. They're both right which is useful and clear to understanding the fact in this economy, when you borrow, you got to pay it, up, pay it back, uh, even though the average return on government debt is less than the growth rate of the economy. Well, I think this one is, but it's up to you. Just be careful. The most careful thing is don't look just at the bubble term. You got to look also at the fact that the other term is going to negative infinity at the same time. Uh, I'm not going to talk about that because we're out of time. Let me give you the bottom line. So, uh, Bottom line of this section, uh, R less than G of 1% is a lot of fun. You get, the, by fun, I mean the kind of stuff that I just bored you with for the last 10 minutes. You get to think about transversality conditions and terminal conditions and bubbles and mining and so forth. That's fun. And when you do it in incomplete markets with risk sharing, liquidity premiums and so forth, you can have a lot of fun, but it's irrelevant for US fiscal problems because it's 1%, it's not 10%. So 1%, R less than G plus 1%, it does allow for steady small deficits that work the way senior edge works and that can lead you very astray if you think the value of debt is the present value of a negative number. But it still is true that big deficits need to be repaid with subsequent surpluses. Uh, this growing out of debt story, not only does it not apply to what we're doing, there's a secret fact, you're writing an out of the money put option. The states of nature where it doesn't work are particularly costless. And the theoretical point, uh, all these discount factor tricks don't work for, they don't work well for infinities. We're technically, we're not in L2 anymore, which was the technical assumption that let us pay all those tricks. Uh, discounting with the ex post return can lead to explosions, even when the economy is completely well behaved and discounting with margin until the present values are, uh, are, are fine. So if you do it, be careful. Uh, but certainly don't pluck our measures from the world, P put them into risk-free models and say we got mana from it. Okay, that's all I got to say. Uh, you were Thank you. Thank you, John. I don't know if uh, Harold or Daryl or Marcus have a comment on the finance stuff at the end or Daryl, go ahead. Daryl, please. Yeah, John, uh, you did it with a representative consumer that can do the discounting. And a lot of the talk is basically uh, we'll let future generations worry about this. It's an overlapping generation setting and there's moral hazard there because uh, it's a hot potato. We're passing it on to future generations. Let them worry about it. What happens in the modeling if you try to do it with an OLG and can the hot potato keep, keep getting passed down and the discounting arguments become irrelevant because it's OLG? 
I left out OLG and dynamic inefficiency and incomplete markets and so forth. In part, I did though, my own reading of that, which is not very deep, but I, I left track at the fact that this has to really go to infinity. And, and so um, the world's gonna run out of places to put people in about a thousand years. And in um, 4 billion years, the sun's gonna blow up the world and the end is over. So th things where it's always a Ponzi scheme that goes on forever seem to me to, to not be, it's fun to play with, but I don't think it has anything to do with our situation. So, but I have not, that's a big part of the argument is maybe there's dynamic inefficiency and the government debt is implementing this overlapping generations dynamic inefficiency thing. And uh, I, my, my own views, it doesn't work real well, but maybe someone else thinks it does. Harold. Yeah, maybe just a small comment on the OLG thing. I think the argument is that if you put land into an OLG model, then you can't have the condition R smaller than V forever because you know, people, people like land and that makes it impossible, at least in the long run. Yeah, any substitute. I think, I think there's a lot to that. I mean, you know, in the, in, the, in the safe world, once you have a risky world, of course, you can have R smaller than G for the reasons that you mentioned. Ah, oh, Marcus is here. Yes. I was hoping you would take the bait. <laughs> yes, so I slightly, I mean, I agree with you that the first term is plus infinity, the second term is minus infinity. That's in a complete market setting. Uh, of course, if you have incumbent markets, you have another precautionary savings term in the risk-free rate, which pushes the risk-free rate down further. And you still have this minus infinity and plus infinity, but you can rewrite the same way you write the middle equation. And then you have a finite term for the first, a, a, a finite negative term and a finite positive term. You can call this bubble term whatever you want, but there is the fact that you can, you can trade uh, government bonds to complete partially complete markets. That's a service this retrading provides, and that shows up in the second term, which doesn't show up if you don't have uh, incomplete markets. And that's sizable. So we quantify and we calibrate that, and that's sizable. That's, that's a real amount. So it's not like this convenience yield stuff. I agree, that's icing to the cake. But this precautionary savings and this potential, you know, you hold government bonds if you have an idiosyncratic shock, that's, that kicks in and that makes a big difference. Right. Uh, and there, there too, the fact that I'm using complete markets and, and, and so forth, it kind of rules all that out. So, you have, so yeah. you're, in your model, this is, goes to a, a positive and, or it could even be a negative, but it goes to a finite number, that goes to a finite number. And you said there's well, another uh, That goes to minus infinity and the other one plus infinity. But if you go to the equation above. This one. This one. So because the transversality condition holds for each individual household, but not for the repressive household, it doesn't have to hold. So transversality condition only has to hold for the optimization individual household, but not for a repressive household in an incomplete market setting. So we get a, a finite number. A finite there. number there, yes. That's the bubble that you can mind. Okay, exactly. uh, I'm, I'm glad we did a little better justice to your to your work on this. Yeah, so that, that's essentially what's going on. and. If the time bearing idiosyncratic risk is coming in, you get this negative beta on top of it. Yeah, uh, which that, is really uh, important. Whenever you're going to crisis, idiosyncratic risk becomes more important. So then the government bonds are appreciated in times of crisis. So this second term or this bubble term really is counter cyclical. Okay, great. So uh, the uh, timekeeper is going to tell us it's time. I'm going to tell you it's time. But uh, thank you, John. This is terrific and learned a lot. And <laughs> Thanks for all the questions and comments. Uh, see you next week, I hope. Thank you very Thanks much. Bye-bye.